Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of library-related topics. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and it is then posted into our archives on our website. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of those archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and that's for all types of libraries. So you will find things on our show schedule that are for um, academics, publics, K-12, uh, museums, corrections, special libraries, anything and everything. <laughs> really, our only criteria is that um, it's something having to do with libraries. Um, we have shows about things that libraries are doing, uh, resources and things we think they could be doing, they could be using, um, services and products we have available here through the Library Commission for Nebraska Libraries. Um, we bring in guest speakers from outside of Nebraska and outside of the Library Commission to talk about what they're doing in their libraries as well. Uh, before we do get into today's show, I am just going to briefly mention uh, for our Nebraska attendees this morning. Uh, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, we are um, keeping an eye on, as everyone is, what's going on with the COVID-19 pandemic happening right now. And we have some resources on our website for our libraries in, in Nebraska. If you're not a Nebraska library, check your own um, state uh, library associate or library association, state library, and they might have the same similar thing for you. We have a post here that is pinned to the top of our blog, so it'll always be at the top of the page here. Um, whenever you come to our website, no matter what new posts come up about um, COVID-19 and resources, and we have a list here where we're keeping as well as we can up on what is happening at our libraries in Nebraska. Are they closed? Are they offering um, limited resources, um, um, services, or whatnot? Um, if you go to our this blog post here, we are um, requesting information from libraries via a web form. If they send us that information, it automatically fills that list so you can see what's happening. And there's a page here specifically to resources related to the pandemic. Uh, depending on your situation, what you're doing, teaching your kids at home, running a business, trying to apply for unemployment, and then this specific page here for libraries. Uh, we are always adding things to here, so keep an eye on it uh, for new things that have um, new um, and for more information, new information, updated resources. If there have been webinars or um, things done online, we have links to those for information and resources from ALA, IMLS, CDC, anyone providing information that might be helpful specific to libraries and what you are doing. Um, our staff here is doing a great job of keeping up on this, organizing it here for you, um, so please do. Um, take a look at this. Uh, the most recent thing we've added to here is a section for um, reopening your library. Uh, this is just guidance. We here in Nebraska, we don't have any control over how you do, do this in your libraries, but we did it together with some information uh, from other states and other organizations that are providing this as just some uh, <clears throat> examples of how you could do um, a phased opening plan for your library. So if you're starting to think about what may com be coming in the future, take a look at that there. So on today's Encompass Live, we are going to be talking about a Nebraska-specific product. And I'm going to switch over to you guys right now. I'm going to give you presenter control here. You should see the pop-up for that. And be able to share your screen. There we go. And this is what we're talking about today, Nebraska Access. Well, they're going to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> Deborah Draco, Alana Novotny, and Susan Nisley are here. They're all here from the Nebraska Library Commission. They all work with our Nebraska Access Database Program. And I'm just going to hand it over to you guys to take it away and tell us all about all the great resources we have here for our Nebraska people. Thanks, Krista. Um, as Krista said, um, I'll start with a, a little bit more of an introduction for each, but also each of us also. I am Deborah Dragos, and I am the Director of Technology and Access Services. And one of my major um, interactions with Nebraska Access for the databases is uh, negotiating with our vendors for pricing and what databases we have available. 
With us also this morning, Susan Nisley is our online services librarian, and she provides a lot of our training and support. Alana Novotny, our technology and access services librarian, helps also with training support, and she takes care of all those technical details like access from libraries, handling IP addresses, authorizations, passwords, et cetera, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. About, a, well, over a dozen years ago now, um, we decided that our patrons needed their own website, okay? And our patrons are basically not just librarians, and Krista showed you the page, the main Nebraska Library Commission page where there are resources and information for specifically librarians, but we also serve all of the Nebraska residents. And the databases that we're going to talk about today are, we figured, were more easily accessible through a separate page. Some of our library staff also put together lists of links and um, other information specifically related to Nebraska that you will see on the main Nebraska Access page, okay? We're not going to actually talk about these categories today, though. We are going to talk about specifically the databases available to Nebraskans, okay? Before we go to that page, though, I am going to point out from here, there is a contact link. So if you do have questions at any time about Nebraska Access, if you have any problems with passwords, with getting patrons getting into the databases, you can always come to this page and there are links specifically for emailing Alana or Susan, or you can call us at the 800 number if you're outside of the Lincoln uh, area, or you can email Nebraska Access, which goes to several people. So you're, if you're not sure who to contact, you can just send your um, message to that email address and the appropriate person will respond to you, okay? So to the Nebraska uh, databases available to Nebraskans. Now you'll notice the button here says login. You don't aren't if your patrons are not actually inside a library, they're not actually logging in at this point. Okay. There is one more step if they're logging in from home or from a um, a a library that does not have static IPs. Okay. The databases um, are licensed specifically for Nebraska residents, so we do have to put in some kind of authentication process. So if a library patron is at a library, your library may be set up for um, IP address recognition, or you might have them put in their library card number uh, on the computer in the library. Um, it depends on your local system. But for all those people who are stuck at home now, a days, um, their main ways of accessing are either a password, and each of your libraries receives a password every six months, or a Nebraska driver's license. Uh, and the third way, of course, is if your system has an authentication uh, system where they can just type in their library code, okay? So those are the main ways to get in. For the passwords that we give to the libraries, we do have a request. Again, it's all related to our licensing. Please do not post passwords on your websites or through social media, et cetera. You can put a notice up there saying, um, on your web page saying, if to get access to these databases, if people don't have a driver's license that they want to use, they can contact the library by phone, preferably, um, and ask for your library's password. They don't have to have a library card with you, but as long as they can, you can tell that they're a Nebraska resident, you can give them the password to get in, okay? now. The Nebraska Access databases that we subscribe to for all Nebraska residents are paid through for 
through funding uh, from the state of Nebraska and funds from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We have been providing databases for over 20 years now, and I think Susan Alana and I have been around for most of that time. <laughs> Day one. <laughs> Day one, yeah. Um, and we can tell you that some of the offerings have changed over time, but we do try to provide um, a bit of a variety um, for different types of information, and we do try to provide as much full text as possible so that people have the full um, information right there and they don't have to put in a request to get the item from someplace else. You'll also notice on this page that at the top we have, we've sort of categorized. So we have databases that anyone can get into, although most of the content is aimed more towards adults. And then at the bottom we have databases that have content that is aimed specifically towards K-12 students, okay? We'll be talking about some, a few of these databases more in depth and we'll sort of skim over a few of the others because as Alana and Susan can tell you, they could talk for hours for many of these databases, but we don't have that much time today. So we're going to try to highlight some things that people can use this for and maybe specifically use it for while they're at home and can't get out, okay? The last thing I'm going to point out before I turn this over to Alana to talk about her first database is you'll notice that there um, is a brief description after each of the databases and there's a question mark. If you click on that question mark, it will take you to a slightly longer description of the database. It may give you the titles of all of the content within that database and often you'll find more help resources about using that particular database. And in the case here, for example, with Masterfile, Alana and Susan have actually created videos, short tutorials on how to use the databases. So there's a variety of ways to find help for each of these databases, okay? So I'll just go back to the main page and turn this over to Alana to talk about her first database. Good morning, everyone. Just a second here. We're, we're passing mouses and keyboards down the, the table here. The, the, first, oh, sorry, Susan. the first resource I want to talk about today is going to be Explora for primary schools uh, or primary students. Uh, First thing I actually want to say about Explora Primary is technically it is not a database, it is an interface. Um, the reason why is because what Explora Primary does is bring together the contents of primary search and Funk and Wagnall's New World Encyclopedia under one interface that students can search. Uh, I don't think much description is needed by, for Funk and Wagnall's, it's obviously a full text encyclopedia. A primary search is a collection of popular magazines. Uh, there's full text articles from about 70 popular elementary school magazines, things like highlights and zoo books. We do have the list of titles included if you'd like to take a look at that. But I'm going to go ahead and jump right into the Explorer interface and show you what it's like. First thing you'll notice on the interface is the large carousel in the middle. Uh, you can see they're highlighting milk snakes, which I have to say is not a favorite of mine. Um, you can scroll through using the arrows. Um, if I wanted to learn more about any of these items, I do have a link here that will run a search of those particular topics. What I'm going to do, though, is scroll down and show you these eight broader categories that are listed here. Uh, this is helpful if you're working with students that maybe find it easier to browse a database instead of doing a specific search. I'm going to go ahead and click on, let me scroll down here a bit, Science and Health. 
you can see on this secondary page here, again, I have these nice topics and these pretty pictures to go with them. That can make it a little more inviting for students. You can see it's just a wide variety of topics. I'm going to go down here to Simple Machines and click on that. And that is going to run a search for the topic of Simple Machines. Um, the first thing you'll see here in the middle of the screen is a topic overview. So topic overviews are included in the Explorer interfaces. Um, and this is just as the name implies, just an overview of that particular topic. I just clicked on the link to bring up the full text of it. This one came from the Salem Press Primary Encyclopedia from 2019. Before I scroll down and show you the article quick, I do want to point out the listen option here. I'm not going to take the time to do it now, but if I click on the play button, the system will actually read the article to you. Uh, this can be helpful if you have students that have find it hard to read articles. Sometimes it's helpful to read the articles at the same time you hear it being read to you. Uh, this, this option of listen is going to be available in some of the other databases today. And it, you can actually download the audio too as an MP3. So even adults who are watching it may find it useful to listen to some of those little longer articles. Um, even download them on your phone or devices and take them with you and listen in the car when you're not commuting to work right now. <laughs> I'm just scrolling down and you can see here, it's showing me the different types of machines. I'm going to go ahead and go back to my results. The other thing about the Explorer interfaces I want to mention is by default, my searches are always going to be limited to full text. So you can going down here, you can see Topic of machines was found in Funk and Wagnalls. So as I mentioned, that is included in this interface. Um, I'm going to go down here to number seven, screen machines. Uh, and point, go ahead, and this one has the PDF available. So this is an article from the magazine Source or Science Spin. And you can see this article looks just like you would see it if you had the journal or magazine in hand. If you have kids at home right now, um, a lot of these magazines have these quick little quizzes, fun little things for them to do. So it could be a good way to entertain and educate the children at the same time. I'm going to go back and refine my search and actually just go ahead and do a new search up here. Um, example, obviously I browse the first time around, but I can also type in a search here. So I just typed in pandas. Again, I have this overview if I'm interested in reading it. This one comes from the Salem Press Primary Encyclopedia. This entry that doesn't look too exciting here is actually a dictionary entry. Probably don't need a dictionary entry for pandas, but it could come in useful for other terms when you don't know what they mean. And then I'm going to go down here and number three, pandas. This is from the magazine Zoo Books. Uh, you can see this particular entry is available both, both as HTML full text and PDF full text. Uh, the HTML full text is just the text. Again, I have that listen option available. And then I could also go ahead and click on the PDF full text. And again, this is going to look just like the magazine article. I know that's a real quick overview of this database, but we have a lot to get to. So I am going to turn it over to Susan, and she's going to talk about points of view. 
And we're sliding keyboards into yep. stuff again. Give us a second. <laughs> so I'm going to stay down in the bottom section of the databases for Nebraskans page right now. And we're going to talk about Points of View Reference Center, which is a great resource for students. Um, this is an online database that contains full text resources that present multiple sides of controversial issues. Uh, according to the uh, vendor EBSCO, this database is aimed at students in grades 8 through early college. And it is designed to help students learn to evaluate and construct persuasive arguments and essays, better understand controversial issues, and to develop analytical thinking skills. It features 1,600 essays that are written specifically for inclusion in the database, and uh, it covers over 400 contro controversial topics. It also, can, uh, it also includes some uh, licensed content in the form of magazine and newspaper articles. So I'm going to go ahead and go in. Uh, as you can see at the top of the screen, there is a search box. There's a basic search option and an advanced search option. So it is possible to search, but this is a database where it is, I think, best to browse. And actually, the way the database is designed, browsing actually walks the student through the research process and reinforces uh, the route that students can follow when doing research. And so. We're going to go ahead and go down the page to Browse by Category. Uh, you'll remember I said that there are uh, over 1,600 essays that are organized uh, by topic. We've got over 400 topics. And they are, uh, again, organized into 30-plus uh, broad categories. So again, this models the research process. You start broad. Uh, you often have to work with students to help them narrow their topic. And so you'll see under each broad category, you've got some narrower topics listed. Um, you will always have three topics listed. And then in many cases, you'll have a link that says more. And if you click on that, you'll see additional topics. So again, your student can start a little bit broad and then uh, zero in on a more uh, narrow, manageable topic. So I'm going to go ahead and click on animal experimentation. And when you click on a topic, you always go straight to an overview article. This is one of those uh, essays that was written specifically for inclusion in the database. So the overview essay uh, presents a good introduction to the topic, and they all follow a fairly standard format. So there's introductory material. There's usually an understanding the discussion section where they define some key terms that uh, students need to be aware of. They usually provide a historical background on how the issue has been dealt with. And then they take a look at how it's being dealt with in contemporary society. Uh, you also have a bibliography, and you also have information on the author's credentials. So you've got the introductory overview essay. If you look to the right, you also have uh, a point and a counterpoint essay. Uh, each of these essays uh, takes a different position on the controversial issue and gives an example of how you would write an opinion piece uh, arguing one point or another. So when you click on one of those uh, point or counterpoint essays, it opens up in a new window. And again, these follow a uh, format that models for students how you might uh, proceed on writing this type of uh, essay. So, there's, uh, so they always label the thesis. They give a summary and an introduction. Uh, body paragraphs that argue uh, the position, a conclusion, uh, thoughts to consider for further uh, research, bibliography, and again, author credentials. So you always have, like I said, the two 
point and counterpoint essays. And you also have a guide to, criti to critical analysis, which is more of a article that guides students through the process of thinking about a controversial issue, taking notes, um, coming up with their own opinions on the issue. One thing that's always interesting is it examines what's the difference between fact and opinion and gives examples that are based on the specific topic that the student is currently researching. So at this point, um, this might be a point at which a younger student would stop. They've gotten kind of an overview and, and um, gotten some uh, arguments on both sides of the issue. Uh, if you're an older student and you have to do additional research, you do have over here on the left a related information box and you have different source types. So if I were to come over here and click on magazines, uh, it's going to automate a search for uh, magazine articles on animal experimentation. And so now I'm going to have uh, additional research to uh, further my understanding, or if I'm writing a paper, additional sources for my paper on this topic. So um, that is a uh, that is uh, Points of View Reference Center. As you can see, the structure of the database really does walk the student through the research process. Um, so that is about it as far as Points of View goes. So I'm going to go back up here and jump back to the databases page. And the second resource that I'm going to talk about is Novelist. Uh, uh, Susan, yeah. yeah, I'm just going to jump in here um, and just let everybody know. So we had some people that logged in after we started this morning. I uh, just want to let you know if you have any questions or comments or anything you want to know or see more about on any of these databases, just go ahead and type into your questions section, anyone who's attending. And I can see that there and pass it on to our presenters this morning to um, answer your question, clarify anything, whatever you need. Um, so far, nobody has any questions. Um, but I just want to remind everybody of that. All right, go ahead. Thanks. Okay, um, we actually uh, link to two different versions of the Novelist Plus database. Uh, down here in the K-12 section, we list to Novelist K-8 Plus. Up at the top, we list, we link to Novelist Plus. So just to give you a little bit of background. First of all, Novelist is an online reader's advisory service designed to answer the question, what should I read next? So I imagine a database like this could be really useful now when you are trying to help patrons identify books of interest when they can no longer come in and browse the shelves of the library. So it's something that can benefit you as the librarian. It can also benefit your patrons if they like to search for their own books. It gives, gives them some great ideas. Um, Novelist K8 Plus is a complete subset of the Fuller Novelist Plus database. Novelist K8 Plus covers fiction and narrative nonfiction books aimed at ages 0 through 18. Um, the full version of the database includes all of that content, plus it covers adult fiction, adult narrative nonfiction, and also audiobooks. Um, because Novelist Plus is the fuller version of the database, that's the one I normally demonstrate. Um, and before I go in, I just want to point out uh, one resource that I think would be really useful for you to print out to have handy. Um, one of the reasons that Novelist Plus is so successful is because the staff members have developed a whole language that they use to describe books and what appeals uh, to readers about a particular book. Um, and they use that language and that terminology within the database to distinguish one book from another. So um, I'm going to go ahead. I clicked on the question mark. And if you scroll down to more help, help resources from EBSCO, you'll see that there is something called the Secret Language of Books, a guide to story elements. It is actually a 41-page PDF uh, document that you can print out but it gives you all kinds of terminology that you can use to describe the pace of a book, the storyline, the tone, et cetera. Um, it lists terminology that they use. Uh, so you have that printed out and handy, and you can uh, access that whenever you want. 
that terminology is also used within the database, and so you'll also see it there. So I'm going to go ahead and log into Novelist Plus. There's tons of material in this database that I'm not going to have time to talk about today. So I'm going to start out and show you the easiest and quickest way to find book recommendations for your patrons. Um, so one way to do that is to ask your patrons for a book that they really liked and they, that they would like to find more books similar to. So I read this book. I want to read more books like it. So I'm going to go ahead and type in a book title here, The Rosie Project. That's a good book. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. all of us have read it here. Yes. <laughs> um, you'll see it's the first book that comes up, so I'm going to click on that particular record. Uh, and if you read the description of the book, you'll start seeing the terminology that uh, novelist staff are assigning to the book. So genres, it's mainstream fiction, romantic comedy, uh, there's a theme, opposites attract, the characters are awkward, quirky, uh, the pace is fast paced, tone is funny, heartwarming, reflective. So again, those are terms that you would also find in that book, the secret language of books. Um, every time you look up a book in Novelist, you will see to the right a read-alikes column, and they will always list nine suggested read-alike titles. Um, if you want to see why a particular recommendation was made, you can hover over the book cover and you'll get this flyout window. It will give you a description of the book and it will also <clears throat> tell you on what basis the recommendation was made. So here it says, both are warm and witty novels, men driven by internal demands uh, find that, sorry, it's really small font, <laughs> uh, find that upsetting their routines can sometimes result in success as they find partners with whom to share their lives. So again, it's saying what is the common element? That can be helpful because once in a while, the common element that they're using to make a particular recommendation may not be the element that you particularly like in the book. In that case, you might reject that particular recommendation. But you get a, usually a pretty good sense of how the books are similar. So again, you can go down and you've got nine suggestions. If those suggestions aren't enough, you also have, whoops, I gotta get off of those pop-up windows. At the bottom of the page, you also have a search for more form, and you can see they've extracted all of the terminology that they've assigned to the book, and they let you pick and choose, mix and match. Uh, the one warning that I have is if you start picking too many of these characteristics, <laughs> you wind up finding only the book that you started with. So um, yeah, I, I usually recommend instead of clicking on a bunch of them at once, uh, mix and match a few at a time and then come back and choose more. So I'm gonna say I really like the theme opposites attract. I think that's what best describes what I liked about this book. So I'm gonna click on opposites attract, click on search, and it's gonna go out now and search the whole database for other books that have been assigned that particular theme. So I'm scrolling down, there's a Debbie McComer book, there's the Rosie Project again. And then, I like this example because all of a sudden you get 50 <laughs> shades of gray, 50 shades free, 50 shades darker. Those might be opposite attracts, but they have a whole different <laughs> vibe than the Rosie Project. So I think, okay, maybe I need to somehow capture some other aspect of the Rosie Project that I liked. I can go back to my form and check one of the other uh, terms, or I can go over to the left and look at um, any of the genre terms or theme terms or character terms that were assigned. So I'm going to go down, and here are some genres that I can pick from, themes, characters. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go to tone, because. I think the tone of uh, Rosie Project and Fifty Shades is quite different. So I'm going to say, I want funny. <laughs> and so now I'm just getting a subset of my original search results. And now these are books that are opposites attract and funny. So I can scroll through and see if any appeal. Um, so that's sort of the basic strategy of how you start with one book and then get recommendations for your patrons of other books. Uh, the one other thing I'll just point out before uh, we move on to the next database, 
Um, from the main page, you'll see over here on the left this sort of unprepossessing column that says recommended reads list. It doesn't look that long or that involved, but you'll notice all these different uh, parameters. You can say fiction adult, fiction teen, fiction ages 9 through 12. You can go to nonfiction and do the same age categories. Um, underneath you have uh, different, uh, different uh, types of reading lists. So you can say, okay, I'm interested in Let's just see the, uh, let's check under for fans of. And here they're actually making reading recommendations based on television shows, for instance. So that's a different way to provide um, readers advisory. So you can go up here and say, okay, my patron likes uh, Gilmore Girls. So I'm going to click on that link. And now I have a nice reading list of books that they think would appeal to people who like that television show. Um, I think I counted up once a long time ago, and once you go through all the different uh, tabs and all the different categories, I think there are over 650 reading lists that are available there, which you never guess just by looking at them. Mm -hmm. So those are great to um, be aware of, to print out, to share with patrons. So I'm gonna stop at this point and turn it over to Lana, who is going to talk about what? Master file. Okay. Sorry, I'm doing the keyboard shuffle again. So the next database I want to talk about is master file. Uh, again, clicking on a little question mark here, we can learn more about it. Uh, it has over 2,400 magazines and journals here. Uh, we do have the title lists available. I'm going to start to get into the database here, but I really do encourage you to oops, read the title list. It may not be quite as fun reading as a book, but it's a great way to see what's in the database. You may run across interesting or maybe uninteresting titles that you may not expect to see in there. For, th for example, there's a wood magazine in there. That magazine contains actual woodworking projects. There's a real cool cutting board I saw that I liked the other day in there. Um, there's magazines like All Recipes. If you're familiar with the website, All Recipes, they do have a magazine, and the full text of that magazine is available in here. Uh, there's Church Pianist and SAB Choir. Those two magazines actually have musical scores in them. So not something I would normally expect to find just by reading the description, but they're in there. And then there's a magazine called Overdrive. Being a librarian, of course, I think of the book website, but actually Overdrive is a trucking magazine. So we know the truckers are busy right now, so that also could be of interest. I'm going to go ahead and see the search box here. I'm going to type in 3D printing. Um, when I showed you Explore uh, Primary before, I noted that by default my results were limited to full text. That is not the case when I search master file. Um, over on the left-hand side, you have a number of ways to limit your results, and you can see one of them is full text. I'm just going to take a look at the first article here. Uh, you can see this is available as both HTML and PDF full text. You can see the article is laid out a lot like I had showed you before. Let's see, it came from the magazine PC Pro. Again, I have the ability to listen to the article. I'm not going to talk about them today, but there are tools along the right-hand side that will let you save, email, print, cite um, these particular articles. Uh, this article has a PDF, so again, this article is going to look like the actual magazine. I'm going to jump back to my result lists. In the master file database, there are also AP videos. Um, if AP videos are available, they will always be in the third spot in the result list. Um, you can either view the ones that are available here, or you can see all, in this case, 72 videos. So I know I'm going pretty quick over this, but this is a pretty basic interface that you'll see as we're searching the databases. Uh, I want to show you a couple unique things in master file that I like to use. One of them is the publication search. This is great 
if you know the name of a magazine or journal you're looking for, or if that patron comes in and has a particular title in mind. I find it sometimes easier to search here and see if you can find the title. And I just use the word search. Technically, this is a browse, not a search. Uh, I could search for some, you know, boring library related titles like library journal or school library journal, publishers weekly. I'm going to go Nebraska. I have to type in Nebraska and I'm going to click browse. Let's take a look at Nebraska life, a little more interesting than those library related titles today. Uh, you can see here in the list, it tells me Nebraska life. The bibliographic records are available from 2005 to present. And in this case, also the full text is available from 2005 to present. If the full text is not available, this line here may be missing. Let me scroll down here. I think there's a couple at the bottom. You can see these particular magazines here do not have the full text available. And so it just clearly does not list it. Um, also, if the full text coverage ends, you will see a date here instead of the word present. I'm going to go back up. Let's take a look at Nebraska Life. On the right-hand side, we can see we have a list of issue, issues here. Before I jump into those, I just want to quickly point out the share button. You can create an email alert. When you create an email alert, the system, whoops, the system will send you an email anytime a new issue of this magazine is added to the database. So that can be really helpful especially for some of those professional reading titles, if you want to stay on top of things. Um, even Nebraska Life can be fun to stay on top of. I clicked on 20, 2020, and I'm going to go ahead and into the first issue. So this is a list of all of the articles that appear in this particular issue of Nebraska Life. I can click on any one of them again to see either the HTML or the full text PDF. I just want to quickly note this particular grave marker here. I saw this article, this picture the other day, and like I just recently saw a photo of this particular grave marker uh, on Facebook, Nebraska Through the Lens uh, group. Uh, it belongs to, I may mangle his name here, Nehemiah Story Hardy. So remember that name. We'll come back to him in just a minute. Uh, but I also want to point out on the left-hand side, over here we have multiple links. So when the PDF is available, I can actually move through the journal or magazine and jump to any particular article I want. So that makes it nice to be able to just go ahead and move through a particular magazine. One last thing I want to show you. Another favorite search of mine to do here is I'm going to go new search and I'm going to go ahead and click on the advanced search screen. And let me type my search in here. So I typed in consumer report and then I selected journal name and then dishwasher. So I know that the consumer report and consumer report by, what did I spell wrong? S on the end of report, maybe? Thanks, Susan. <laughs> so I know consumer reports, the consumer reports buying guide are both included in this database. So now I'm able to pull up a recent article for Consumer Reports from March 2020 that tells me why I need a new dishwasher. Actually, I already knew that, but now I have some more reasons to go out and buy a new one. But this definitely can be useful if you're looking to make some purchases in the near future. I know that was pretty quick, but we have a few more databases to get through. The next one. I want to point out is MyHeritage. It is a genealogy database. And so what better to do when you're stuck at home? And how about taking up genealogy as a pastime, do a little research, find your family history? Okay, not everybody in the room agrees with me, but it can be kind of fun. So 
there is a ton of information here. I just can't show you all of it. Um, if you are new to genealogy and you have relatives that lived in the U.S. Um, before 1940, I would suggest starting with the U.S. Census. Uh, over here on the right-hand side are different categories of information that you can search, but I'm going to go right ahead with the U.S. Census. And instead of trying to find one of my relatives, which is actually kind of hard to do, I am going to go ahead and enter in Nehemiah Story Party. And we know he lived in Nebraska. And if you don't remember his name, that was the guy who belongs to the big tombstone that I just, or grave marker that I showed you that's shaped like a desk. So here he is. Um, well, you guys didn't have time to read the article. That tombstone is located in Nebraska City. So it's a pretty good guess that this first record here is for that gentleman. He was actually an insurance agent. You can see here, um, they say his, he was born in about 1931, 18. or 1831. In 1860, he lived in Nebraska City. We can see here his wife is Mary. He has three children listed here. Um, I think that Article City actually had 10 children. So uh, we have the actual census image here. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into that. I want to make sure I point out over here, it, up here it tells me he appears on line 31. So that can be helpful. because This handwriting is pretty good. Sometimes it's a bit hard to read the handwriting. Oops. There we go. There his, is, is his entry, his wife, children. You can see it does list their age at the time of the census was taken in 1860. And look, he is an insurance agent. And so you saw his desk. <laughs> um, you can, what I like to suggest doing is going through and trying to find a person in all the different census years that they could appear in. So remember, census are done every 10 years. So I could just kind of work my way through the years here, see if I can find him. Uh, obviously, I prepared this search ahead of time. And I can tell you, I did run into some problems finding him in all the years. So I'm going to go over here and just say, edit my search. And I'm going to go ahead and do an advanced search. Just want to show you a couple things here quick. Um, under his name, his first name, it says match name exactly. I don't want to do that. I want to go similar names. And then also as a residence here, I'm not going to do a match optional. I'm going to go match required for Nebraska because we know he lived here for sure. And as this starts to display here, we should find other records for Mr. Harding. Uh, you got to be kind of careful because, for example, this record here of 1910, I'm assuming this is his, actually his grandson because this person was born in 1901 and this is the 1910 census, so that would make that person nine years old. Um, also remember, a lot of these documents are handwritten, and that means someone had to go through and transcribe the handwriting. Mistakes do happen. You can see this entry here is F Story Harding. Uh, I went and looked at the original record. I'm assuming, again, this is maybe the son of the original gentleman I was looking. But when I went and read the handwritten record, it's clearly now an F, or it should be an N in my mind. When I read the handwriting, I see an N. But I can also see how someone who transcribed that information transcribed it as an F and not an N. So. Uh, you kind of do, do some searching here to find these people. It takes a little bit of effort. So that is what 
I suggest you lead if you're new to genealogy. And as like I said, a person was born or lived in the United States. Um, the other thing I want to show, if you're more an advanced searcher, over here under browse collection categories, or browse, I cannot talk anymore, browse collection catalog, this is a list of all the different collections. There's over 6,000 different collections in this database. Um, I like to go over here and sort my results by last updated. So this will tell me, if you have a couple here that are featured, but then they'll also tell me when they're last updated. And they also highlight when new collections are added. So if you've been doing genealogy for a long time, and I think it's helpful to go in here and look to see what's recently been updated or added. So I would know for, for my particular family, um, the Iceland census might be great, but I know none of my relatives ever lived in Iceland, so uh, that may not be of use to me. But some of these other ones, I know I've never searched before, and they might be useful. Um, so I can go out and search those individual collections. Yeah, I'm being told I gotta hurry up. So I'm gonna go back. One last thing I wanna point out quick here is under the question mark, I do have some information about searching the US Census. If you're really gonna dive into it, I would suggest taking a look at this. For example, the 1890 Census, it was destroyed in a fire, so you're not gonna find anybody in that census here. Pretty straightforward there, isn't it? You're not going to find them there. It's not there. <laughs> the last few databases, I, Susan and I just kind of want to briefly highlight here. Susan, I believe you want to mention. Yeah, and you can just sort of point to them on there if you want, since you've got the books over there. Okay, <laughs> um, so Consumer Health Complete, I just want to say a few words about it. Uh, the intent of this database is to provide non-health professionals with access to easy to understand health information. So in this database, you can often find condition descriptions, articles from health encyclopedias, entries from reference books. And you also can find articles from health oriented magazines that are aimed at consumers. Uh, examples include Men's Health, Yoga, Journal, and Prevention. And they also do have some articles for more academic journals like American Journal of Public Health and Pediatrics. So that's Consumer Health Complete. Um, down into the left is Legal Information Reference Center. Um, we always like to point out this is not a substitute for personalized advice from a lawyer, but it is a great tool uh, for researching the legal implications of lots of situations that we all deal with uh, throughout life. So, um, marriage, divorce, adoption, immigration, landlord, tenant disputes, estate planning. Uh, this database actually includes uh, close to 200 full text NOLO guides, which um, if you saw an example, you probably uh, recognize it. Uh, these guides cost anywhere from $14 to $40 on Amazon, and so you have access to that full text uh, content in this database, those uh, legal uh, resources for your patrons. Um, moving to the right, we've got an icon for a small business reference center. And this database is, is set up in many ways uh, in a similar fashion to Legal Information Reference Center, but it obviously focuses on issues of interest to people who are running small businesses or considering starting one up, so there may be people in your community that would have, get a lot of benefit out of this database. Um, one thing to keep in mind, it's not just for people who have brick and mortar businesses, it also talks about ideas for in-home businesses, online businesses, um, people who, have, uh, uh, who offer services, etc. Um, like Legal Information Reference Center, it also features full text uh, NOLO guides, but it also has a lot of business and professional trade journals. So, for example, you can find you can find trade journal articles um, from publications that focus just on the car wash industry, for instance. So that's something you've never probably subscribed to in your library. Um, they also have sample business plans, so uh, you can walk people through how to set up a business plan. Um, uh, just lots of uh, other resources like that. So that's kind of a summary of Small Business Reference Center. 
I want to mention quickly the two biography databases here, Biography Reference Bank and Biography Reference Center. Um, both databases contain full text biographies about both historical and current folks. Um, I would love to be able to tell you, you should always search one first because it's the best, but I can't do that. Uh, both databases have pluses and minuses. Um, I've had some librarians say they love one particular database and turn around the next week and I'll have another librarian tell me they prefer the other one. So my suggestion is try searching both of them and see what's going to work best for you. I know that's not a whole lot of help, but that's how it is. Um, the next two are Psychology and Behavioral Science Collection and Science and Technology Collection. Um, as the names imply, these are both um, subject-specific databases. Uh, they do tend to have more scholarly type journals that they would work well for your high school students and even professionals in the community, especially like when it comes to the psychology behavioral science. Um, it could also be useful for staff in the school who deal with student behavior and those type of things or even parents of students that may be dealing with, with different psychological and behavior issues. <clears throat> okay, and I'll talk for just a minute here about WorldCat. Now, we all know that no library can buy absolutely every book, movie, CD, etc. Um, that their patrons might want to borrow. So if you have a patron um, who's looking, you know, who wants to know what all an author wrote and who, where the, he, those items might be located, WorldCat is a good resource. They have library holdings from libraries all over the world. Once you find what libraries own that particular item, then you can put in a request. Now, the Library Commission does do the requesting through OCLC, who, which, um, has, which provides the WorldCat database. For those libraries, we are still doing interlibrary loan for the libraries that come through us. <clears throat> there is one caveat, though. Um, because so many libraries are closed, we are only asking for items from Nebraska libraries where the staff are still working. So we obviously don't do not have access to everything because not every lot. Even if you combined everything um, that every Nebraska library owned, you'd still have patrons asking for things that weren't available. So good resource. Take a look at it when you have a chance. And there's one more database I want to very, very briefly mention up at top here is Explora Public. This is very similar to Explora Primary that I showed you, except it searches um, a different collection of databases. I clicked on the question mark. You can see the databases listed here that are included. I'll let you go back and read those later if you'd like. Um, you'll see that the interface looks a lot like Explora Primary. Again, I have this carousel at the top that I can go through. I have eight topic areas here that I can browse. They do have specific topics I can click on or I have a more link. Unfortunately, this is where the difference sort of ends. We don't have any more pretty pictures. We're adults, I guess, at this point, and we have to read the topics. We don't get pretty pictures to go with them. Again, I can click on any of these and perform a search. I have the box up here where I can type a search. I did want to show you that they do have COVID-19 obviously here under learn more. You can see my search results. We came back with quite a few results on this very current and up-to-date topic. As you can see here, it just looks like the same interface we showed you before in master file, explore a primary. It's also the same one that you would see in the science and technology and the psych databases. That's the whirlwind tour of Explora Public. I think that's all we have. Thanks for listening today. Is there any questions, Krista?
Uh, let's see. Thanks, guys. Um, let's see. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, type into your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface, and we can pass them on. Or anything you wanted to see in more detail. It is a little after 11 a.m. Central Time, which is our official time for um, wrapping up uh, the show. But we will go as long as it takes. If anyone does have any questions or anything else you needed to sh uh, share, I did have my little introduction in the beginning about. Uh, what we're doing at the Library Christian to give libraries information about COVID-19. So I know I do cut in a little bit to our presenter's time now. <laughs> uh, um, I think it's great. I love Nebraska Access, and I, I would, especially the fact of it being available to all citizens in the state. Um, it's not, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to go through your library. You can if you want to, um, but it's just a really, you know, awesome resource that I think we're putting out there for people. And and I wish more people knew about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, when I share things about it, I try and you know, many things that I share online and to people. You know, I assume many of my friends and family may just skim over things library related because it doesn't apply to them, but it really does in this case. <laughs> And Krista, if anybody has questions later, please feel free to use this contact option and reach out to Susan, myself, for both of us by using the Nebraska Access email. Mm -hmm. Yep, that'll go to both of you. Uh, we do have a question now. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in. Uh, someone wants to know, how often are the databases updated? It really depends on... Um, couple different things. How long our contracts run? <laughs> I um, think they meant how often the magazine journals are oh, added. Is that okay? Could we get a clarification on the question? Yeah, do, you mean, how, yeah. do you mean like how current is the information in there? Yeah, how current is the information? Yes, or, yes, uh, that's what he wants to know. Yeah, how how yeah, like is it having all, yesterday's newspaper? Adding, yes, they're always adding material. Mm -hmm. The magazines, um, I. I think that uh, Nebraska Life, when I was looking at, was from, was it April, March, April, April? It was very recent, that's all I can tell you. I felt looking at the top of my head, but. Sometimes you'll get the magazine content uh, online here before you get your print copy in the mail, so. There, yeah, there are a few publishers that do embargo some titles for maybe a couple months or something like that. But, I'll, but the content is being updated all the time. And those tend to be more academic ones that are embargoed. Right. Um, sure. Probably sure. from my notes, the Nebraska Life one was the May-June issue, so I don't think you can get much more current than that. Yeah. Um, so, so it's going to vary from publisher to publisher, really. It's yeah. not like the whole system as a whole has the same. Correct. Yeah. And now I know I've looked at it before that we do have information like these are the lists of the different journals. Does it indicate when you go into their like does each database tell you somewhere how current their their particular things it are? Does not. Those lists tell you when, oh. for example, the full text coverage starts and when the full text coverage end ends, oh. but it doesn't tell you the most recent issue. Uh, oh. to find that I would go to the publication search that I showed you in master file. And when you go to that list, like I did for the Nebraska Life example, then you'll see the most recent issue available. Sure, okay, yeah. Um, and then someone does wanna know, how do we get our access password number, the password that you do mail out? This is and Elena, you can contact me. Yeah, if you don't have yours yet, yeah, reach out to Elena or use that Nebraska access email right there. And just to clarify, Nebraska Access per passwords change twice a year on April 1st and January, or April 1st and October 1st. Um, all passwords are me emailed out to the library director only. Um, that's just how our system is set up. But if there are library staff that may not be able to get the password from their directors for whatever reason, uh, they can reach out to Susan or myself and we will gladly share that password with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So you probably got an email a couple months ago um, about it, but by now in May, who knows where that email might be. <laughs> that password actually would have been, for the April change, would have been set out right about the 1st of March. Right. So we give an overlap, that way libraries can get those passwords out to their patrons Mm -hmm. And not be suddenly cut off with act, without access. You're giving a little head heads up, yeah. Passwords work as soon as they're emailed out. Mm -hmm. 
So old password and new one work at the same time for a little bit. Yep. As Why soon not? as as soon as that new password is sent out, it works. Yep. Uh, we do send out the passwords for the October change almost probably about two months early now because we try to get it out before the new new school year starts. That oh. way schools can start with that new password and don't need to worry about changing it until April. Right. Rather than starting up school and then saying a month later, oh, now we have it, now everything's different. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Well, it doesn't look like anybody's typed in any other desperate questions right now. That was a couple of good ones there. So I think we will um, officially wrap up uh, your presentation for today. Um, uh, okay, the reason um, she said our library is closed and can't, she can't get into the library's email right now. So yeah, use your personal email, then reach out to Alana or Susan or using that Nebraska Access one, and then they can send that to you to a different email address. It's as long as you just tell them who you are and where you're at, not a problem. Or just call us. Yeah, that's true too. Um, oh, and uh, clarify again why we, um, someone's asking, why can't we publish the password? Explain about that. These are resources we purchase from vendors and we're paying money for just the Nebraska residents to access them. So mm -hmm. as soon as you post a password on the web, you're allowing anybody in the world access. And we can't do that because we have signed contracts with these vendors saying we're going to limit access to only Nebraska residents. So by posting those passwords, you're breaking our contracts that we have signed with the vendors. Right. So you can't post them publicly out on like, you know, your websites and social media, but you can, because I think you do provide in the in the libraries thing there, you can give out like little uh, business cards that list them or something. You can, when it comes back to being patrons in the libraries, we do have business right. cards that you can hand out to your patrons. Right. So locally you can hand someone it printed on a piece of paper, but we're talking about somewhere where like, as you said, described, anyone in the world can see what you put out on the internet and that's not. That is not, in web, not on websites, not on Facebook, um, don't publish it in your local newspaper. Mm. Uh, these are all things I've seen, and I hate to tell you this, if I do run across them, you'll be seeing an email from me, and I will force you to change your password. And I hate to do that, because it's a pain for all of us, but um, those are the steps we take when we see them published like that. And another thing that I think might not people might not think about is, you may do a newsletter that you put that you print out, but you also put a PDF version of that or something of the, a copy of that on your website available too. You can't have the password in that newsletter, even though you do hand out the paper ones, because if you then follow up and put it on your website, because then it's out there for everyone. That's true for both public libraries and schools. Yep, you got to think about that as well. Yeah. So thanks for answering the question. Excellent information. Thank you very much. All right, let's wrap it up now. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you, uh, Deborah and Elena and Susan. This is a great overview of our Nebraska Access. There are tons of databases and there's lots of information as you can see. This is just to give you kind of a, an idea of here's what it is all about. Um, jump in there and explore. Thanks, Krista. Thanks, everyone. All right, so I am gonna bring back control to my screen here. There we go. All right, so today's show is being recorded and it will be on our Encompass Live website. You can search our, uh, if you go to the Library Commission website, you can search in our search box up here for Encompass Live, or if you use whatever is your search engine of choice. Uh, Encompass Live so far is the only thing called that on the internet. Nobody else is allowed to use it. <laughs> so you will get our um, main page there. So here's our main page for Encompass Live. The archives are right here underneath our upcoming shows. Today's will be at the top of the list here. Should be ready by the end of this week as long as uh, GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. I will get it up there. Everyone who attended this morning and uh, registered for today's show get an email from me and we will push it out also to our various social media from here and the um, Library Commission. While I'm here in the archives, I'll show you too, we do have a search feature here, so you can search our entire show archive if you want to find um, a, pre a topic from previous. Uh, you can do the entire archive or just the most recent 12 months. That is because this is the full archive for uh, the history of Encompass Live. And I'm not going to scroll all the way down and drive you crazy, but with that, um, but we uh, premiered the show in January 2009. So over 10 years worth of archives are here on this page. So if you are searching the full archives, just pay attention to the date of when something might have been originally broadcast. Uh, some information may still be good now. 
uh, and you know hold up over time. Some things may may not. There be uh, there may be services that don't exist anymore, services that have changed, uh, websites or links that don't work anymore. So just be aware of what you're um, looking at when you are uh, looking at our old archives. Um, you can also just do it, um, limit your search to just the most recent year, if you uh, 12 months back from when you're searching, if you do want to make sure you have something current and up to date. So that is, um, we also have a Facebook page, you can see I've linked to here, and it's over here where we do post updates, reminders to log in, uh, letting know when new shows are being added, when the recordings are available on here. So if you do like to use Facebook, do give us a like over that, over there, and you'll get notified about things going on with the show via your Facebook account. So that will be wrapping up for today's show, and I hope you join us next time, um, and or for any of our other shows. You see we've got things booked here through May and June. I've even got some July dates I'm working on, so you'll see those up, show up here soon. Next week, we'll be talking about the census. The census is still going strong. Uh, you can still um, answer the census right now if you're working on it. Uh, one of our libraries here in Nebraska, Martin James Public Library, actually received a grant from ALA. American Library Association to help promote it more. And Denise Davis from there will be joining us next week along with our Government Info Services Librarian, Mary Sowers, to talk about uh, the grant that they got at Martin James Public Library and um, more tips and tricks about how you can um, share information and get people to com uh, complete their census questionnaire. So please do go ahead and sign up for that show. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning and hopefully we'll see you on another Encompass Live. Bye-bye.